Okay, so this week we're going to look at the rise of fascism in Germany and Italy, well, Italy, then Germany, uh, and go over uh, our second form of kind of totalitarian regime in this unit. When talking about fascism and the rise of fascism, oftentimes people think of, of Hitler and, and think that he somehow came up with it, but he, he didn't. The idea of fascism actually originates with Benito Mussolini, uh, and he's from Italy. Uh, because we haven't really talked about Italy before, or it's been a minute since we've mentioned them, uh, I want to remind you that Italy is a constitutional monarchy, and prior to World War I, they're a largely agrarian society, meaning most of the people who live in Italy work as farmers, and uh, they're subsistence farmers who uh, farm off of land that's owned by the Italian nobility. Italy is reluctant to enter World War I. You might remember that they leave uh, the Triple Alliance when they get an assurance from France that they'll be okay, and so they stay neutral for the first year of the war. But by 1915, Italy is given an opportunity to, uh, well, they're given a secret promise of extra land and new colonies if they help the Allies win the war. The Allies, seeing the stalemate of the first year of World War I, become desperate and try to woo Italy into the alliance, and Italy joins. But because the promises are, are vague and, and not public knowledge, most of the soldiers who are peasants fighting for the Italian army in World War I don't really understand why their government is sending them into this war. It seems like a conflict that has very little to do with them, and they had already made the decision to stay out of it. On top of that, factory workers are given new government contracts to produce goods for the war effort, and another case of total war. And that means that we have factory workers who now have their jobs changed by the war as well. So we have the soldiers and the factory workers pretty dissatisfied with the war. And by the end of the war, that dissatisfaction spreads to every class of, of Italian society. Um, there are bread riots as there are food shortages. We see strikes and anti-war protests, uh, which create so much chaos throughout Italy that the Italian government actually has to send their own army to their own towns to calm the chaos down. Now, hopefully as we go through this, you're able to make connections between what's going on in Italy and Germany to what we covered in Russia and the US. Because what I hope you're starting to see right now is that there's a lot of common themes in the 1920s and the post-war world, regardless of where you are on the globe. Um, Italians were really dissatisfied with the Treaty of Versailles at the end of the war because that secret land that they were promised, even the government doesn't get as much land as, as so even the government is dissatisfied because they don't get as much land as the Allies were promised because when it comes to the time to write the treaty, uh, Britain and France take care of themselves first and Italy's left with small land gains but nothing significant. So the next two years of uh, Italian history get or the next two years, from 1919 to 1920 in, in Italian history. This is known as Biennio Rosso, which is the year, the two red years. Um, and they're called this because they're just a period of straight chaos. Uh, there's a failing economy, as we see in a lot of the post-war economies. Uh, they struggle, as well as a lot of political instability and calls for revolution. Um, the lira, which is the Italian currency of the time, ends up being worth a sixth of what it was at the start of the war, which means that your savings account now buys a sixth of what it could have. And that was really uh, disastrous for a lot of people in the economy, especially those who, who had savings accounts like the elderly who, who were re retired and weren't necessarily taking in a new income. Unemployment skyrockets as the government has to cancel all of those militaristic contracts because they no longer need the factories to produce weapons because the war is over. But that means that the factories don't have anyone to produce for, and so they don't have anyone to pay. They don't have any money to pay their, their workers, and it's not exactly a great situation. And hopefully you can immediately identify um, another instance of this that we've already covered, right? Uh, unemployment rising doing, due to canceled government co military contracts should ring some bells. Uh, unemployed workers also have to compete with the returning soldiers for jobs. And so we see at a time where the economy is getting smaller and contracting, we see more people looking for fewer jobs and that competition creates friction. 
Even for those who do work, working conditions are largely what we've talked about with factories in the late 18, early 1900s. They're not great. And wages are low, which is a problem because the money buys even less stuff with the rise of inflation after World War I. And so workers start to go on strikes in an effort to get higher wages. So we see unions forming and strikes and, and high unemployment and a rising inflation which are all pretty key indicators of us going into some sort of economic depression. And as uh, things are not going well for Italy, we see the people turn away from the, the constitutional monarchy, away from Victor Emmanuel III, the king of Italy, and they turn towards a political party that promises them meaningful change. That political party happens to be the Socialist Party. And by 1920, it is the largest political party in all of Italy. The second largest party in Italy is the uh, Catholic Reformers Party, and uh, they get called the Popular Party. And while the Catholic Reformers Party is also arguing for large change and maybe not straight up revolution, but, but a big change to the politics and the way that people are cared for, um, they don't actually work with the Socialist Party because they're at odds. Uh, but, but you see the Ital Italians are flocking towards people who can promise them change. Both parties end up organizing strikes and using their ability to um, unify the message in order to, to really put pressure on, on businesses and things like that. Uh, the photo that we have on, on this, this slide here um, is a factory in Milan where the workers took over and held it at gunpoint. In 1920, uh, late summer, August and September, we have uh, the Socialist Party organize strikes so effectively that they actually have what's called a sit-down strike. So rather than standing outside the place of work and, and demanding change, in a sit-down strike, the workers actually go into the factory and they don't let the owners in. And so in the sit-down strike, we see for three weeks, the Italian workers control the factories, uh, much like Marx theorized when he was talking about the, the kind of um, communist revolution that he thought would come, like that the workers would seize the factories from the factory owners and then work the factories for themselves. And here we have the, the Socialist Party of Italy pushing for that, that Marxist revolution. And the government and the industrialists, industrialists is a way of, of saying factory owner, uh, they... They end up just waiting him out because while the factory workers are in control of the factory itself, they don't control the supply lines, they don't control uh, the actual means of production, and so uh, the factory worker owners just kind of wait for the factory workers to run out of steam, and then um, the the strike ends, and it turns out that they didn't really replace the ruling class. By 1921. The radical members of the Italian Socialist Party are frustrated that they're not seeing the change that they want, and they, they reform into the Italian Communist Party, and they start calling for a Bolshevik-inspired revolution. They're wanting someone to lead uh, sub like substantial change, just like we saw Lenin do with, with Russia. And in response to this call for a Bolshevik revolution, we see a variety of different groups come together to kind of a attack the communists. And so we see war veterans, nationalists, uh, and students all attack anyone who, who's labeled as a socialist because of, of fear of this like Bolshevik revolution. We see violence towards socialists. Hopefully you can also connect that to something we've already covered in this unit. Um, it's interesting to note that these these groups of like the veterans, the nationalists, and the the students, they're all funded by wealthy landowners and industrialists. The people who have benefited from a like free market capitalist system, they're giving money to ensure that the socialist revolution is unsuccessful. One of those anti-socialist groups is run uh, by by this man here, Benito Mussolini. He was a war veteran, a journalist, and a former socialist himself um, who, who gets funded by, by wealthy industrialists to write a paper called uh, Popolo di Italia, the Pe People of Italy. Uh, and in that newspaper, he spouts off a lot of anti-socialist rhetoric. Before World War I, he was actually a student of Marx. Uh, he, he strongly advocated for a lot of Marx's ideas, um, but after the war, 
and seeing the Russian Revolution, um, Benito Mussolini believes that there's a better way forward and that it, that way is not like some sort of socialist revolution. Uh, he says that his his newspaper, Popolo d'Italia, speaks for the, the soldiers and the workers um, and it, it argued in favor of one clear leader that Italy's chaos was caused by too much compromise, uh, too many voices uh, being heard. And so what he thought Italy needed was one person in charge who can make all of the difficult decisions and move the country in the right direction. And he just happened to think that he was the right guy to be that one man in charge. It's a weird coincidence, you know. Um, he also uh, is really anti-socialist in a lot of his rhetoric, he talks about how socialism is a danger to the people of Italy and that um, it's bad. I don't know. He, he really didn't like it. He went from being a, f a firm believer into it to like really, really hating it. Um, he also in the, uses this newspaper, newspaper to promote extreme nationalism, like really aggressive, jingoistic, we're better than everybody else kind of nationalism. Um, and and says a lot of things tying Italians to, to their ancestral heritage of the Roman Empire that like, the Italians are the greatest race on the planet, and we know this because the Italians created Rome. And, and you look at any sort of popular civilization in 1920, and he could point to elements of those civilizations that all tied their connections back to Rome. And so his argument is that, you know, really it's, it's the Italians who are, who are the best. Um, and he, he believes that change has to come through violent struggle. Similarly to Marx saying that uh, a revolution can only happen when, you know, there's a violent overthrow of, of the ruling class, uh, Mussolini argues for something pretty similar. In 1919, he creates the Fascio di Combattimento, which is the fighting band. Just please don't judge me for the pronunciation. This, this group uh, are made up of people who are really unhappy with the current political situation and looking for a place to belong. One of the things that I find really interesting in, in these uh, paramilitaries, because that's basically what this is, it's going to be a group of people who train to fight um, but are not actually associated with the government, is, is that war veterans, after fighting in World War I and coming home and struggling to readjust to civilian life, they're pretty eager to, well, not all of them, but we see um, a decent portion of the members of, of Mussolini's black shirts, which is what they're going to get called, um, joining this paramilitary to find that sense of, of normalcy, right? Like they become so used to being a part of the military during the war that now that the war is over, they feel like they don't have anywhere to belong. And here comes Mussolini with this perfect place for them to, to feel like they fit in. And it makes sense. And it tells them that they're better than everyone else in the world and that they should be mad and that they can make change. And it's, it's really persuasive. Um, the reason that his action squads are called black shirts is because Mussolini dresses or designs their uniform to mimic that of an elite squadron in the Italian military. And so they wear all black and get a fancy dagger uh, and use other weapons as well. But the fancy dagger is key to the outfit. Um, and these, these men dress up in a uniform that has nothing to do with the Italian government. Uh, and they patrol cities and they attack socialists and communists and people who are advocating for like a republic and, and Catholics and uh, unions and anyone who, who stands in the way of, of the, the fighting band. And um, they use violence to, to gain compliance, right? Like someone at the time basically said that Mussolini was just a mob leader, that he had an angry group of thugs who would follow him. But unlike the mob, this angry group of thugs wore a, a uniform and felt uh, a connection to kind of a, a greater or higher calling. Uh, in 1921, Mussolini, Mussolini transforms the black shirts from just a ragtag gang into an official political party. Uh, and then they call it the Republican Fascist Party. Uh, this word, fascio or fascist, comes from 
uh, an Italian word, or a, sorry, a Latin word, fasces, which means a bundle of sticks. And it was a symbol of victory and strength used in ancient Rome. In fact, like uh, when, when vic victorious military leaders would come back to Rome, they would be presented with a bundle of sticks as, as a part of their, their uh, awards, signifying their, their greatness, their strength, and their success. If you look at any money, like our American money, if you can go find a quarter or look at the back of the dollar or uh, anything where we have the eagle, you'll notice that the eagle itself is holding in one of its feet uh, a bundle of sticks that, that I think they're arrows, but it's the same callback to this idea of, uh, or it's a callback to the same iconography, which is a symbol of military success and victory. And so trying to make that connection between ancient Rome and modern day Italy, Mussolini names this group after this this word that has that connection to to the empire of old and when he he joins the republic or creates the republican fascist party he gets the support financial support of industrialists and large landowners they're really worried about the way of a socialist movement because what's going to happen if the socialists take over what's going to happen to wealthy capitalist factory owners if the socialists take over like they're going to be taxed more. There's going to be new government regulations that are interfere with the, the free market of their business. Um, you know, there's going to be a, a lot of changes that might mean less profit for, for the factory owners. And so uh, to make sure that the socialists don't take over, Mussolini, uh, they give money to Mussolini's political party, so hoping that the fascists are the one in charge and and that they'll be more protective of free market capitalism. Mussolini does a lot to gain followers pretty quickly. Uh, he holds large rallies. He's a really charismatic speaker, um, and he he has a lot of anger, and he expresses that anger, often attacking um, people who had nothing to do with the problems that he's angry about and using inaccurate facts. But the fact that he's uh, saying things that aren't true and... Uh, you know, attacking people who aren't at fault doesn't matter because that anger and dissatisfaction that he feels with the current state of Italy, that, that rings true for a lot of Italians who are dealing with high unemployment and, you know, food shortages and, uh, you know, money becoming more worthless by the day. They're, they're pissed and they don't really care how accurate uh, Mussolini's facts are, they just want to be angry at someone. And Mussolini is quick to point out who the real enemy is. From 1920 to 1922, uh, the Republican Fascist Party goes from being a pretty small party of less than a thousand people to a party of, of almost 250,000 people. To put that into perspective, that's like going from a party that is half of the student body at Northwood to every human in Irvine. They got a lot bigger really quickly. I mean, they're still not the biggest political party, but, but they are growing and they are growing fast. In that summer of 1922, Mussolini ends up having to use his black shirts um, to end a strike. There it is, uh, the Socialist Union had, or the Socialist Party and unions had worked together to organize a really big strike. Uh, industrialists were really frustrated because production was slowing down and, and money was being lost and people were crying out for the Italian government for the king to do something to stop the strike and the king was debating with Parliament they were trying to figure out what's the right thing to do here do we get involved in the strike do we let the strike like sort itself out what what do we do and uh, Mussolini says, well, if the government's not going to do anything, I'm going to do something. And so he leads his black shirts on a march to the factories where the strike is happening and uses like physical force and violence to break up the strike. And then uh, feeling so emboldened by the success and power of, of his group of people, he marches on Rome with uh, several thousand supporters. You can see in, in the photo at the top, we have Mussolini, uh, he's got the, the sash on, and the rest of his black shirts marching on Rome. They're carrying fascist flags, they're, they're ready to take over the government. And Mussolini is, is, you know, 
advocating for violent struggle to create change. He wants, he wants a faster, more successful Italy, and he doesn't think that Parliament and the king are really the way to get there. And so as they march on Rome, the king has to make a decision. And ultimately, he decides to appoint Mussolini as prime minister to try to avoid a revolution, thinking that if he can bring Mussolini into the government, maybe the government can, you know, stay. Because Parliament actually had a lot of the political power, uh, the government power in Italy, Mussolini being prime minister doesn't give him like total control over the country. Um, and the Republican fascist party in Parliament was still a pretty small minority. So once Mussolini is made prime minister, it's not like he's immediately in charge of everything. In fact, uh, it takes him taking elections into his own hands to really put him into that dictatorial position where it's just him in control of everything. So uh, in April of 1924, during parliamentary elections, Mussolini sends out his black shirts um, to stand outside polling stations. And I said use violence to coerce and vote voters on the slide, but like the directions he gave his black shirts was the first person who walks out after voting, you beat him up. And you beat him up for voting for a socialist. It doesn't matter who he voted for, beat him up for voting for the socialist and then wait outside the polling station. And all across Italy, the black shirts did exactly as Mussolini ordered and, and it, it changed the, the election, right? Like people were scared to vote for socialists. The voting is supposed to be a private thing. And, and here was this public demonstration of violence that the police weren't able to stop. And so um, we see a mass number of fascists get elected to parliament in this election. But is it really a fair and free election? The leader of the Socialist Party didn't think so, and he publicly says that this is a fraud election, that uh, it cannot stand, that they immediately need to hold a second election, a real one that's fair, that doesn't force people to, to vote one way through threats of violence. And then the leader of the Socialist Party, the largest party in Italy, disappears. And a couple days later, his body is found. Can you imagine if the leader of the, the Democratic Party just disappeared and then wound up dead? And then the president took uh, ownership for f or responsibility for, for killing the person, which is what Mussolini does. When the leader of the Socialist Party uh, wind, winds up dead, rather than denying it, Mussolini says, yeah, absolutely, I had a hand in it. I took care of him. He was a problem for Italy. I got rid of him. And all of the non-fascist members of parliament look at this act of extreme violence at taking out his political enemy, uh, his political opposition, his political challenger. He just kills him. And they all say, we quit. This is not a legitimate government. We're not going to show up to work and pretend that this is somehow legitimate. And so all of the non-fascist members of parliament walk away which only leaves fascists in parliament and Mussolini is prime minister. And so by December of 1925, uh, with no one really to, to vote against the, the fascist ideas, um, parliament passes a law promoting Mussolini to Il Duce or leader. Um, and, and he takes on that, that title as, as a name, kind of like Caesar or King. Um, and then he, he's, it, he alone is in charge of Italy. You can see here him, him giving uh, a speech to, um, I think it's in Rome based on that arc, but he's giving a speech to, to people. And that, that's a lot of people in the crowd. And, and, you know, he was so animated and spoke to things that really resonated with the people that he, he was able to gain followers, even with his uh, calling for violence and um, admitting to being extreme. A lot of people thought that once he took power, he would calm down, that a lot of the violent rhetoric was just to get attention, um, and they, they were wrong. So once Mussolini is in charge of Italy, uh, he really enacts his idea of fascism. And a fascist state is uh, here defined in a quote by, by Mussolini, all within the state, 
nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. Everything anyone does is for the benefit of the country. Um, and not in some like communist or socialist way where we're like doing it to help each other. No, no, no. You have an obligation to be loyal to your country and give your country everything they need. Not in a, we're going to rule it together. There is no compromise. There is no collaboration. There is Mussolini and he will lead us forward. Uh, another thing that Mussolini is really vocal about in his criticisms of democracy and, and communism uh, is that this idea of majority rule. He, he says, it's in this quote in the red box, fascism denies that the majority, by the simple fact that it's a majority, can direct human society. He says that, you know, people are dumb and more of them doesn't make them smarter. Uh, his argument is that letting, letting decisions be left to the everyday person is not going to lead your country to success. Think about it. He's saying this in 1935 during a time where we're at a global Great Depression and the, capu the capitalist countries of, of the world are really struggling financially and, and the, the democracies, especially the capitalist democracies like the U.S. and Britain and France, they're not super successful. And so here's, here's Mussolini saying, yeah, what did you think? You let, you let everybody decide. Super dumb and real bad. And so he goes through and he, he makes his fascist state. He starts by replacing labor unions with something called corporations. Not like businesses of today, but corporations were government controlled or government supervised organizations where representatives from uh, workers and business owners and local, you know, government officials came together to uh, discuss and, uh, and agree to set prices, to set wages, and to set the amount of hours worked. Basically doing a lot of the functions of a union to, uh, like a union negotiation, but, but this is now a government supported thing. So the corporations take over the different industries. And this allows Italy to streamline a lot of the processes because when you have one person making a lot of the decisions and forcing them through, change can happen really quickly. And so Italy was able to industrialize fairly rapidly, even though it had been slow to industrialize uh, in the mid 1800s. They're able to build uh, an impressive steel and power and chemical industry, as well as uh, help thousands of workers find jobs as they expand all of these industries. So again, in the middle of the Great Depression, when the U.S. has one in four Americans unable to find work, Italy has almost full employment. And they use that to, to convince more people to come along to his side. Local mayors and town councils uh, both having been elected by the people, they get replaced by party loyalists, people who are loyal to fascism, people who are loyal to Mussolini. And Italians lose the dangerous freedoms, right? Freedoms of speech and assembly, and the press becomes heavily censored, so much so that they create a government agency called the Ministry of Press and Propaganda, which chooses which books can be published, what articles appeared in newspapers, and what films could be shown in theaters. The reason that they wanted to limit the amount of freedom was Mussolini argued that that freedom and and debate and all of these things, they they divided the people. And now was not a time to divide Italians. Italians just needed to um, accept that someone was going to lead them and they needed to follow and they needed to trust and be loyal and and that freedom and and other things that those might come later. But but right now was a time for action not debate. And if you disagreed with, with uh, Mussolini, you were going to get forced into complying or you would be arrested and exiled. While, uh, you know, Italy doesn't have the gulag like Russia where they just kick people out into Siberia, Italy does have a bunch of tiny deserted islands and they would kick people onto those. Um, but we see Mussolini make, make use of uh, the military as well as a police force that Anytime someone looked like they were being disloyal to the government or, or uh, you know, critical of Mussolini, they would be fined or arrested 
or, or a whole bunch of other things. Mussolini also makes a really, like, uses to great effect spies and secret police. Unlike regular police who wear uniforms and identify themselves as police officers, secret police operate in plain clothes and do things not out in the open. And so um, Italians became afraid of speaking their feelings, even in, in private settings, because if you were hanging out with a group of friends and you said something critical of the government, one of those friends could always be working for the secret police and then you and your family get arrested. Mussolini also establishes special courts that were designed specifically to try anyone who opposed fascism or the leader himself. These courts would go through trials very quickly with very little evidence and were often not public. So people would get arrested and then go through a very rushed judicial system before being sentenced. Um, and we see, we see that same thing happening with, with show trials in the Soviet Union. Uh, similarly to the sh trials that we saw with the Palmer raids, that like people were getting uh, exported, not exported, uh, that's the wrong word, exiled, d deported, deported um, from the U.S. with like very little representation within the legal system. Um, Mussolini had, prior to becoming dictator of Italy and a journalist, was a teacher, uh, and he uses his understanding of, of indoctrination to um, really target the youth of Italy. He changes the curriculum in schools to make sure that it talks only about the things that he wants the kids to learn. And indoctrination is this word that means teaching someone, usually children, to accept a certain set of beliefs without question. Um, and so Mussolini redesigns the uh, curriculum of Italy to, to make sure that the kids grow up having never questioned any of the truths that, that you know, Mussolini says are true. Um, he bragged once that he could tell on any given day, on any given hour, he could tell on what page of the textbook every child in Italy was on. The curriculum was that established, that everybody was following the same thing. And then you have these kids go to school all day, hear about how great their leader is, how wonderful fascism is, how Italians are actually better than everybody else in the world, and they go home and they live in homes with their parents and they hear their parents maybe be critical of you know, Mussolini or the fascist government or maybe dissatisfied with the current state of things. And those kids go to school the next day and they tell their teacher and then their teacher tells the secret police and then their parents get arrested and those kids get raised in a state orphanage where they're further taught to follow blindly, uh, you know, these, these fascist ideas. I, you know, I think Northwood does a better job than... I don't know, better job than most. I know that Northwood spends a considerable amount of time and effort teaching you how to be critical, how to question things, how to not just assume things to be true because someone tells it to you. And, and that, that level of critical inquiry that you have to question the authority of something, to question the veracity of it, to question the bias of it, that, that level of skill that you're developing right now was something that Mussolini would have found very dangerous. And so rather than focusing on critical thinking and problem solving, Italian children were taught to um, believe, obey, fight. Actually, like, fight. Uh, he creates youth groups that become all but, like, legally required, uh, kind of like the scouts. And those youth groups would uh, meet after schools and over summers and they would teach boys how to fight and how to run military drills and they would encourage girls to get married really young and have as many children as they could. Uh, Mussolini also makes really good use of slogans that he puts everywhere uh, and those slogans are designed to just constantly reinforce the fascist ideas of, of, of loyalty to the state um, and, you know, Mussolini is always right. 
when I gave the lecture on Monday, um, people said that uh, the like, I asked like what's an American slogan, and then we came up with America, the land of the free. And I, I think that that's a pretty good, like, common slogan, right? Land of the free, home of the brave. That's the kind of propaganda that we we hear. Um, it's a little bit different in fascist Italy, where it's Mussolini is always right. That's literally a, a common slogan that gets published everywhere. And believe, obey, and fight. In fact, here we have uh, some examples of, of these slogans and, and kind of what fascist Italy looks like. So here we have... Um, a line of paramilitary, I think they're just black shirts, uh, walking past a wall that says, believe, obey, and fight. Uh, we have a building with this giant eagle holding a bundle of sticks. Uh, and it, underneath that says, Mussolini is always right. And then next one in the color photo, we have a picture of a textbook. So this was one of the textbooks that Italian kids would study from. This was apparently Francis's textbook. Uh, and you'll see that on the cover of it, we've got a small child dressed up in a military uniform uh, of, of Mussolini's like youth group. And then next to that, we have photos of, uh, we have a photo of, of kids actually dressed up in, in that like, you know, the boy summer camps. Because you remember when you went to summer camp and they gave you a gun and taught you how to run drills, like kill communists? No? Okay. Um, and that's, that's where we're going to leave Italy. Uh, because once this is out there, once it, it, it shows that it, because it, it works, right? Like they're in the middle of a Great Depression and, and Italy is able to, to provide jobs and make decisions and show, show strength. Although maybe they're not as strong as they look, but they, they look t to an outsider pretty strong. Um, so from 1919 to 1945, we see fascism really spreading across the majority of Europe. Um, fascism can be kind of hard to define because it doesn't look exactly the same in all of the different places that it crops up. But I think that we can agree on some common themes where it's intensely nationalistic and it oftentimes is seeking to revitalize or purify a nation, like going back to the day when we were great or making ourselves better or stronger, right? This idea that if we were without this group of people who don't really belong, we could be a more united nation. Uh, and fascism almost always argues that it is doing this in the name of something noble and glorious and great. Like Mussolini is taking these actions to save the people of Italy, to make the world a better place for the people of Italy. And that noble purpose in fascism is almost always war and military conquest. We see fascist parties in the 1930s really develop in Italy, Germany, and Spain, although um, there's fascist political parties across the globe. Even today, there are fascist parties in the US, there's fascist parties in Italy and Germany still, like they don't hold the majority, but but they're still, they're still there. Fascism didn't die, it just got quiet. Uh, in general, fascists use violence uh, against enemies. They'll create an enemy and an us versus them attitude. Uh, they'll celebrate action over reflection. Later will be the time to think things through. But now, now is the time for doing is a common fascist ideology. Uh, and oftentimes fascists place their faith not in the government or the structure of the government or the nation, but in one very charismatic leader. Like, uh, we do things for Mussolini, not for Italy. Fascist states favor uh, safety over freedom, oftentimes saying that we have to limit your freedoms in order to keep you safe. And that this is done for the greater good. You know how, like, at the airport, you can't take on giant bottles of water. Not that anyone's going to an airport these days, but, like, you can't take a bunch of liquids into an airport. That's a limiting of your uh, freedoms in order to protect the public safety. And that's something that we, we tend to be okay with when we understand why. Fascism takes that to an extreme level. And we also see fascism uh, condemn and attack anything that threatens the fascist ideology. So uh, this idea of individualism, that you yourself matter, that you're you know unique, 
you're, you're not unique. You're just a part of the system and you're there to make sure that the state is served. Um, is a fascist ideal ideology. You're like, you're wonderful. Please don't think of yourself as just a cog in the machine. Um, liberalism, feminism, democracy, communism, all of these things, fascists argue, uh, divide and weaken the nation. They don't bring people together. And uh, the 1930s are a time for bringing the people together at any costs. Okay, so we're going to stop here for now. And then we'll move on to Hitler.